Hey guys, um, welcome back to the class. So in the last lecture, we went through time value of money and hope you guys understand about uh, perpetuity, annuity, and we also discuss a little bit about compounding and inflation. So today we actually get into something interesting. We are going to start our um, kind of long driven series of fixed income securities. So fixed income securities actually well cover, I would say, how many lectures? This lecture will be a bit short, but yeah. I also maybe we need three lectures, four lectures just on um, pricing this fixed income security. So yeah, it's definitely really important. And I think you guys may infer some definition for fixed income securities by looking at this word because fixed usually means interest rate is kind of fixed, right? So yeah, that's basically the definition. And yeah, so let me start with our course overview for this. So first of all, we're going to have uh, I'm going to talk about the industry overview about uh, fixed income securities. So get you guys understand who issued it, why do we need it? Then we're going to talk about valuation in terms of over in general, why do we value this bond? How do we value this bond? Um, yeah. Then we're going to get to the valuation of discount bonds, which is the simply simplistic, most simplistic type of bonds in the market that is a fixed income security. And in the next lecture, we're going to get to the valuation of coupon bonds in details. Afterwards, possibly in the third lecture, we may be discussing about the measures of interest rate risk, corporate bond default risk, and subprime crisis. And now the readings is a bit, I mean, be behind is that in the original lectures, you guys were reading about Bradley Myers and Allen, chapter 2-3. Now you guys should read on chapter 23 to 25 as part of our reading. So yeah. Once again, I'll put the link below, PDF on um, this rule. Basically, it is the introduction to corporate finance principles. And I think it is particularly useful if you guys still have not read chapter one to three, you guys are supposed to do so for the last two lectures, I mean, last three lectures. So please hop back to open the book to read again. Okay, so let's start um, with the industry overview of fixed income securities. First definition, the official definition given to that is basically they are financial clients so it's promised cash flows of non-fixed amount paid at fixed dates. So what does it mean is fixed income security is not something like a stock market investment that you got a certain you get a certain return. Uh, you get risky returns in the stock market, but fixed income securities get paid fixed amount of return. And when we classify fixed income securities, I think there are a, a, um, a few familiar objects right here you guys know about. So the first thing is actually treasury securities. If you're American, you guys should know about the US T-bills, US treasury securities, bills, notes, bonds. Also J, um, GJBs, UK GALs, bonds, yeah. These are basically treasury securities issued by, you know, the Department of Treasury. If you guys know, there's a US treasury where U.S. Treasury basically is the organ organization that gives money to the Federal Reserve System. And then we also have federal agency securities that apply mostly to the U.S., but these are securities issued by federal agencies such as this a uh, FHLB and FMA. And also, yeah, also Freddie Mac and Freddie Mac, um, if you guys know about it from financial crisis to large mortgage companies, they are backed by the government. So they are also part of this federal agency securities. And also corporate securities are comprise mainly, you know, for instance, commercial paper, which are actually securities issued by businesses, which is a misconception that many students have that people believe that um, many people believe that fixed income can only be issued by like government in the public sector, but that's actually wrong. Then also corporations, private enterprises are capable of issuing securities as a way to borrow money. But it's usually larger businesses who issue these securities, and then people are going to buy and sell and trade these bonds, trade these fixing house securities in the market. And in the, you, in the meantime, you're going to understand what do I mean by fixing house security in terms of paying back and maturity. It basically works in a way that when these corporations or the government borrows money from the investors, citizens, um, in a maturity day, they have to give back a certain interest rate that we refer to as a coupon. And that's how it works. Basically, it is like borrowing money. But it, it can be traded, it can be bought because, you know, kind of like equity. And in this way, people can borrow more money because, you know, um, usually issued by the large corporations and the government. 
The wills are municipal securities issued by our municipality seen on particular nation. Also, there is mortgage-backed securities and derivatives. Okay, so that is the industry overview. And fixed income securities are extremely popular in the financial market because not everybody is willing to take the risk of investing in the equity market, right? In the equity market, people want to play with stock and play with, you know, futures, possibly option swaps. And an equity market is highly risky. Even fixed income securities can be risky due to uh, no matter which country, due to the country you're in. Not only risky in terms of the government or the corporations is not able to pay back the money. That's not the risky point. But the risky point that lies in fixed income securities is basically the point that sometimes inflation can be going on. And when there's inflation, you know, sometimes you invest in fixed income securities, you get interest rate, but in the end, you may even lose money or if you, and you might even have not earned anything, even like a little bit of return due to inflation. However, government, um, these agencies still make some alterations to control inflation and ensure that inflation does not um, go um, go to a certain extent. And that I'm going to discuss this in deeper in the deeper phase in our next lecture where we get to coupon bond. Okay, in this real review, so yeah, that is a uh, market debt in 2006. Sorry, it is a bit early, but if you look at that, most of the uh, most of the uh, bonds are actually mortgage related. And the second pie is corporate corporation. And then we also have treasury, uh, federal money market, federal uh, asset backed, and municipal. So the large cake is actually mortgage related and corporate. And here is an example that you can find on like Sigma, but you can also find in you know Bloomberg. But this is basically a diagram showing you the mortgage corporate federal agency. So if you see, if you look at this municipal asset back, you see you can you can see the differences. Of how many particular assets are issued in the United States. And just now it was a market debt, and here's a market insurance. And you can see mortgage related still plays a large pie right here. If you look at this interesting uh, table showing you the average daily trading volume, you can actually figure out that actually many bonds are trading in the U.S. Some people not really, some people not really a uh, concern. Uh, some people not really, uh, not really, you know, how do I say? Some people are not really willing to take risk, as I mentioned just now, and therefore the trading volume for bond is actually quite high. And bond is actually kind of uh, actually fixing on security because. Depends on the bond, but usually they have low risk, low return. Okay, now getting to the fixed income market participants, which I believe is highly important, is that the fixed income market participants can be highly complex. Um, even you know, in the financial crisis, you know, fixed income seems really easy, seems pretty simple. Basically, you just give the fixed amount of money back to the uh, investor. But it's highly difficult because we also have to price fixed income securities in the future, which is again linked to our time value of money and net present value discussion that we went through in the last few lectures. So there are three different parts in the market participants for the fixed income market. They are issuers, intermediaries, and investors. So the issuers can be the government, can be the corporations, commercial banks, which are the banks that are dealing with lending money and you know giving loan lending money, interest rate. And also states, municipalities, SPVs, and foreign institutions. So they may issue these fixed um, debts in order for people to uh, in order for people to buy. So they want to finance their business, finance the government, uh, for public infrastructures, for public administration, for development of society, so, so on and so forth. And there's also intermediaries, which are can be primary dealers, other dealers. They may be working in investment banks and even well, or other financial services companies. So absolutely one of the most important player in this intermediary section is investment banks, which are different from commercial banks as they don't really um, care, about, um, care about the finance in terms of lending and borrowing money. They uh, work with IPO, investment banking, merchant acquisition, uh, stock market trading and selling of financial instruments and financial instruments development, derivative, derivative products and account management. So that is investment banks. And there could be also credit rating agencies. So, you know, credit rating agencies for instance, for instance, uh, I don't really know the exact name, but there are credit rating agencies, and their job is basically to provide rating for particular bonds. So they probably do; they are doing the rating for these issuers. For instance, if a particular corporation always um pay the maturities, maturity is basically the date when 
the issuer is going to redeem the bond the fixed income security to pro to give the interest rate and to give the principal sum back to the investor and this uh, this thing our uh, credit rating agency is basically basically provides a ratings for instance AAA, BBB, AAB, AA, CCC, something like that to basically uh, you know, to basically indicate how credible are these issuers based on the frequency and their abatement, whether they've been returning the money on time, whether they've been paying back on time, so on and so forth. There are also credit enhancers, which are these people who actually bring, uh, who are these people who actually bring customer and uh, who actually bring the two parties together to attract consumers. So a better definition of credit enhancer, they are the folks that actually help the credit. Um, they are the folks that help the credit market by providing insurance to the credit. Sorry for that. So they basically provide insurance to the market, and that's where our credit enhancer works. And it's particularly important, especially during the 2008 crisis, because insurance still play a large part to many businesses, and it does cause less panic in the market. If many equities are not insured in the market, or can be a negative consequences, market is going to get panic, and you know it will be a mess. And Recession is going to happen. Liquidity enhancers are basically the counterparties that try to uh, try to put buyers and sellers together to increase the liquidity of the market. Okay, and then we have investors, which can be government again. Government may invest in certain debts. They may buy debts. Debts. There can be pension funds, um, can be insurance companies, and again, commercial banks may uh, may invest in funds, mutual funds, hedge funds for institutions, individuals. So what you're saying here is issuers can also be investors. Yeah, so please keep, my, uh, keep in mind of that. Especially issuers, investors, commercial banks, intermediaries, investment banks, the stealers, credit rating agencies, enhancers, and liquidity enhancers. Okay, now just showing you a simple example on valuation. So three different terminologies we have to understand is pretty easy. First is maturity. So maturity is basically the time when the, um, when a bond is going to get redeemed. So if something has a, if for instance here you're looking at this example with a three-year bond, then the maturity is basically three year because at the end of the third year you're going to get the money back, and when it is matured, that means the government, uh, that means the issuer has to pay you the interest rate along with the principal. So it is your second terminology. Principal basically is the money you borrow to the issuer at the first time. So for instance, a principal of thousand dollars. That is the principle. A coupon is basically the interest rate. It is a fancy word saying the interest rate for the bond market. It is a fancy word. People refer it to the coupon. But when you see something like an annual coupon payment of 5%, it basically means whatever you borrow to the issuer, each year you get 5% of your principal sum. Yeah, that's it. And in the day of maturity, you're going to get 5% again. If you're looking at this example, and you're going to get a principal sum back. So for instance, if the three-year bond with principal of a K, an annual coupon payment of 5% has the following cash flows. So first year you get 50, right? Which is 5% of 1,000. Then you get 50 in the second year. But in the third year, since it's a three-year bond, you have to, um, it is your date of maturity, year of maturity. It means you not only get 50, but you also get your principal sum back. So in the end, what you receive is 1,150. So through this investment, you actually earn, if we don't take account of inflation, um, $1,500. And now, now that is about a fixed income and when we get to the definition part of fixed income it seems pretty straightforward isn't it because there aren't too many steps to say just to give you just to define what is a fixed income then it seems pretty easy for many people but it is one of the most complex department ever in an investment bank or financial services company for instance if you, you can research about this company called wellington uh, wellington financial services and in this particular place and i know Importantly, in Wells Fargo, Bank of America Securities, which is Marilyn Lynch, um, and, and you know, in, in uh, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, you always will find uh, a division of fixed income. They will have a large division specifically on fixed income, and what they are working with is mainly this red word right here, valuation. Remember, if you recall our very first lecture yesterday, that I talked to you guys the two fundamental challenges of finance, evaluation, and management. Which, may, uh, which management is easier than valuation, which is a follow-up byproduct decision-making process of valuation. Valuation is highly difficult, and that's why today I'm basically telling you how to evaluate a discount pure bond, which is pretty difficult, because you know now we know that what is a bond, but how do you evaluate even 
if we take most simplistic assumption, can be highly difficult. Okay, so time value of principal and coupons is what we're taking account of. Remember our um, second lecture, third lecture, playing around a dollar today doesn't worth a dollar tomorrow, dollar tomorrow doesn't worth a dollar today. And we have to take into account these following five risks, which are inflation, credit, timing, scalability, liquidity, and currency. So inflation definitely, in terms of how our economy is going, um, that um, in the future, in, in a particular time, or in general, money is not going to worth as much as today, which is a trend of our economy, trend of our world. You know, a dollar, a dollar when uh, during my grandparents' time, one cent can buy a whole box of ice cream in the countryside that my grandpas were living in China. But you know, now one cent can't even give you a bus ride. Then it's credit, because credit, credit is in terms of whether people are going to pay back credibility, which can also be linked to inflation. Inflation can cause a decrease in credibility, timing, liquidity, how, how liquidity, how liquid is market, how if markets overall not so liquid, then people facing this problem not getting the bond back, not getting the return back, which can be serious, and currency. Because currency, not only inflation can weaken the currency, but purely talking about currency, trade issues can cause international relations and trade issue can cause large large parts large, can cause large impacts on the currency strength can increase and decrease based on trade um trade affairs however for now consider riskless step only for this lecture and one question i want to leave with you guys is whether the u.s government debt or the treasury bill bond are are completely riskless and we're going to consider risky debt later but now and since we want to assume it now and many businesses many government jobs are considered almost not risky especially in developed nations so we're just now going to focus on u.s government debt that um well uh, assuming that they're riskless and answering this question in my subjective point of view which may be different to you folks or different to this micro fox in the um, other other um department is that i feel like u.s government debt is quite riskless in terms of getting the return, but it is a riskless. Do you get my? It is a riskless. Do you get my point? When we take into account microeconomic forces, what do I mean by that? So U.S. government debt, as I actually have emphasized a little bit of this in my, uh, I say five minutes ago, is that government debt. If we consider risk and if we define risk as the incapability to pay back the debt, then I would say the U.S. debt is not really risky. It's pretty riskless because they are going to pay back what you've been investing. Government usually don't hesitate to pay back. They usually have Federal Reserve to pay back from the Treasury. But the risk comes from where? If we define the risk as inflation, microeconomic factors, that cause interest rate and cause the debt to not have any value anymore or decreasing value, then it is highly risky. For instance, in the 2008 financial crisis, before the financial crisis, possibly if you see 5%, People do get some earning from this investment. But when the financial crisis hit the US market, inflation and these problems are um, quite unpredicted. Therefore, you may be investing in the US government debt, even they provide a 3% interest rate. But in the end, you find out that you didn't really earn anything from this investment, or you earn even less, you make some losses from this investment. So it is all possible in terms of this risk, microeconomic risks. Okay, now we're going to get to the valuation of these compounds and now we're going to study this most simple bond called the pure discount bond. But value, valuing pure discount bond can already get you messed up, can be pretty complicated just to uh, value pure discount bond. So pure discount bond is also called this strips, which is a separate trading register, separate trading of re register, interest and principal securities. Yeah, so that is, oh yeah, you get the definition here. This is strips. Or we also call pure discount bonds zero coupon bonds. These are the coupons. These are the bonds that have no coupons, so they don't pay you interest rate, but they pay a single payment of principal and maturity. So, so guys, you have this here, right? You have this guy. Um, so this is a three-year bond. So this must not be a pure discount bond because they're paying your coupon. But if we don't have this, ignore this part. Ignore this part. But if you only see this, if this is what you get that it is a pure discount bond, which means there's no 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 coupon payment going on. But the last time when the, uh, when the bond is going to mature, 
you're going to pay back your principal money and pay back the interest rate. So in the end, they're going to pay you like a thousand and fifty. So I can reward this a pure discount bond with principal of a thousand dollars and annual coupon payment of five percent over a year has the following cash flow a thousand fifty. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> okay, so bond trades at the discount to face value. So um, we have one other name, not only zero coupon bond or strips, but also we call them single payment bond because they only have a single payment. Valuation is a straightforward application of NPV. So the formula is basically the NPV formula that you guys know about, which is F divided by um, 1 plus R to the power of T. They're already determined. And yeah, that's about it. Because thinking about that, since we only have one, since it's only paid one time, we just have to calculate one time as well. So our formula is very simple. Um, that is basically similar in the same principle of what we've been discussing over the last two lectures. But what if R varies over time, then different interest rate from one year to the next? That is a good question. <laughs> then we have to denote by RT, the spot rate of interest in year T. So now the first terminology, because the whole thing is going to be super confusing when we talk about bonds, so please keep it. Keep in mind about things like spot rate because spot rate and many other rates like what you guys are going to know about uh, have to know about in the following lectures. So spot rate of interest is basically the interest between two times from now and the future, or the future period of time to the future period of time. Spot rate of interest actually is not so complicated. It basically just means the interest rate between year t and year t minus one. So it's the interest rate between two consecutive years. Guys, get what I mean? But if R varies over time, if R varies over time, then we have one year spot rate of interest at year T, and then we have something like this. With different R at different times. So our now our formula is larger than the formula we've been uh, for the pure for the pure discount bound, because R now varies. In this case, we have to our denominator is going to be the product of one plus R one times one plus R two blah blah times one plus R T. But the problem is thinking about time and risk that we went through as the two fundamental elements that also challenges is that we don't observe the entire sequence of future sparrows today. That means we, we know the formula has R1, we know the formula has R2, we know the formula has R3, RT. Do we really know the number accurately? We don't really accurately know the numbers right now because we're not so sure about how the interest rate are going to go in the near future. And today's T year spot rate is an average of one year future spot rate. Yeah. So here's our formula if R actually varies. And yeah, it can sound a little bit vague, but now I'm introducing you something called a little r. So I know if you look at this, now you still feel a little bit confusing. That is okay. Because in the end, after we have this loan formula, assuming we actually know the interest rate, we will get to this small formula with a little r rather than a capital R. And this r O to t basically denotes today's t year spot rate. And this r is actually what well, can you guess can you guys guess what does this r indicate? This little r is actually the geometric mean or geometric average of all the are here. So I think you remember you remember if you are in your math class or some class if you took you, you should understand the difference between arithmetic mean and geometric mean average. So for the arithmetic mean average, what people do is the arithmetic mean is just done by your simple middle school average calculation, adding all step together, divide by the number of elements. Geometric mean average takes account of compounding effect that actually it's formulated in a way that I'll show you later. I'm going to show you now, actually. Okay, so here's the geometric mean formula that you guys should know about, although you don't have to do it manually, you have Excel to do it. So this is your arithmetic mean. Basically, it works by adding all the numbers and divide by, um, by the amount of elements, which is applicable maybe in math, maybe in stats, 
but not really in finance because if you actually try it yourself, if you have one year, one year interest rate, this is like your APR, uh, your annual percentage rate. If you add all the stuff together and you divide by the number of elements, you get a certain interest rate. But it is isn't a real interest rate. But the real interest rate indeed comes from this geometric mean calculation that seems a little bit more complex. And if you look at this, doesn't this look at our old friend right here? Doesn't this look at our friend right here? Really similar, isn't it? So this is how it works. And since lastly we have to do something like this, which is to power it in terms of 1 divided by n, or to uh, find its nth root, we will, be, we, will be, we will do this division, like here. We'll do the same thing as what geometric sequence did, geometric mean did, 1 divided by n as exponent, which I'm going to do it here. And then you are going to get the 5 year strips. So it may still be a little bit confusing, but now I hope you guys can get a better understanding for the R. So we have the large R's, R1, R2, R3, present, representing and indicating different interest rates, different spots rate at different periods of time in the future years. And in the end, your denominator becomes 1 plus R, and then you have something like 0 to T to denote the time period, basically means 0 to T with a comma. And that is a geometric average. Once we get the geometric average, once we get something like this, we have this little r here, and here is actually an example that in, two, uh, uh, in this August 1st, 2001, which you get particular data for the maturity. Afterwards, you have this little r, and for your denominator, what you do is you get the results. So your, your number is basically um, 0 0.797 because we're calculating five years strips, five years of our pure discount bound. And if you take one divided by five as exponent and minus one, you'll get four point six four percent and then you then all you're getting is a f f this means four point six four percent is actually the interest rate between year one to year five so that's how interesting it is right and many people may ask if I want to calculate the interest rate from year one to year five why can't I just do like a division or something like that the answer is the price is the average price showing right here. This is a pretty confusing part. If I make myself clear today, I hope you guys, I think you guys will grasp the saw, the grasp the wind of it. Is that when you look at year one, year two, year five, these numbers right here do, do not represent actually the price of year five, but the average of the price in five years. That's how it works. That's why when we calculate five year strips, we need to take the price when we do something like we, we, we have to do something like a this root of fives to find out the price at year zero. In the end, after the number, we want the percentage, so we minus it by one, and we'll get 0 0.0464, and then we can convert it back to 4.64%. Uh, so that's how it works. And yeah, this I hope this isn't confusing, just a little bit more um, to solidify our knowledge. Suppose we offer several of these comprises today, we basically get something like this. Right, just as what I've been explaining just now, dividing our denominator, which is a product of one plus the various interest rate throughout different years. And now I want to ask you a question to see if you guys actually understood about this. Is when I divide the denominator p0 to 2 divided by p0 to 1, what do I get? Yes, you get r2, isn't it? you get R2. So if you divide, divide something like this, divide this by this, second year's price to first year's price, well, once you formulate it in this way, you actually get R2, which means you are able to get you're able to actually get the interest rate. So isn't that interesting? When you divide P02 by P01, you'll get R2. When you divide by P04 to P03, you'll get R2, R3. And then you're able to actually determine the interest rate. Therefore, when we only know the price, suppose we don't know the interest rate, we are capable of calculating the interest rate. However, now we are, remember, we are still under this assumption that we are actually certain of the future price, which is actually not certain in the real market, because in the real market, you know, 
inflation, time value of money, credibility, timing, liquidity, economic conditions, micro forces, all put are all contributors to whether assets will be valued in a particular industry. So this is a turn structure that maturity and R0 and T that you guys can think about. And now, how do we value the compound? So, as I mentioned just now, that when we divide, when we make the division that I talked just now, when we divide in a way that, P, for instance, P0, T minus one, divide by P0T, which is the example I mentioned just now, P0, T divided by P0, one, you are able to distinguish and find out the spot rates between P0, T minus one and P0, T. As I mentioned, if I divide by P02 by P01, what do I get? I get R2 in it, and R2 is the interest rate second year. So if we do this calculation, we're able to find out the, actually the spot rate between year one and year two, which is actually acting as interest rate between year one and year two. And if I take T and divide it by T minus one, I'm able to find the spot rate. Okay, so I think now I'm making this formula quite clear for you guys that you, you guys should be understanding about how does this industry actually work. And now we want to get to this turn structure in terms of spot and forward rate. So I don't really want to confuse you. So I want to actually define the word first. What is a forward interest rate? They are actually today's rate for transaction between two future days. For instance, T1 and P T2. So forward interest rate can be highly unpredictable, can be highly hard and complex to forecast due to its complexity. So basically, we're thinking of what is today's rate between two future transactions in the long future. And now I want to introduce another terminology that you guys should also know when you guys study, uh, when you guys try to value this compound is that there's something called future interest rate. That is even worse than forward interest rate in terms of risk. That is rate of transactions between two future days, T1 and T2, but we can't observe and we don't know, even for today's rate. So we now have spot rate, which is a rate between two transactions, can be from today to tomorrow, can be from today to next year, can be from T1 to T2, which we do know. And the forward rate is something like today's rates for transactions between two future days, that we don't know, but it is today's best guess of what the interest rate is going to be in today's rate. Sorry, it can be confusing, but you can listen back again. And the third is future interest rate is future forecast of the rates between the transaction of two future days, T1 and T2. We don't know and we don't observe. So that is how it works. For a future transaction to borrow money in the future, the terms of transaction disagree actually on today, which is when T is equal to zero. The loan is going to be received on the future day T1 and repayment on T2. So the forward transaction may be highly risky because you don't know whether the loan, whether the interest rate you set is good, is, is it too risky, is it too stable, um, whether uh, how how is the credibility of the repayment. So you have a lot of considerations to take in terms of a forward transaction. But the forward rate compared to the future rate is more related to today based because we're agreeing something actually on today, t equal to zero. So even though the transaction is taking place next year, or I don't know, in a future day, maybe five years from now, we're already setting our interest rate right now in turn and already setting certain strategies to, to um, in, in already setting strategies in terms of how much interest rate should we set, um, how do we borrow money, how when do we lend money, when do we borrow money, how when do we repatriate certain assets. Something like that. And a note for you guys is, the future spot rates can be different and usually are different for current corresponding forward rates. So the future spot rate, if you think a little bit more about, is actually a spot rate taking into account of inflation. So when we convert back to today, they do not really correspond exactly to today's forward rate but in that, we have to do some calculation, and then you guys know about it. 
So I want to show you guys this table right here that may look to be confusing, but actually it's cool. Basically, it's an illustration explaining what I've been discussing in the last few slides. That as time goes, as the year of maturity goes, we're changing our interest rate. And our geometric mean is going to be changing. Okay. Now, so until now, because we still have a lot to go. So pure discount bound. I want to do a brief summary about it. So you guys should know about it. Pure discount bound as this bond that pays only one time. It is a single payment bond, zero coupon bond. A stripes, which is a um, standard registered trademark of uh, in the, um, something like principal security, and a discount bond pays one time only. But however, interest rate may alter, which means we may have different R for our denominator. We may have R one, we may have R two, we may have R three, and as a consequence, we are coming up with something called a little R, which is a geometric sequence of all the R throughout many years. To our t and when we try to value our discount bond we are able to take this approach when we do not know the interest rate we're able to finalize and calculate the interest rate based on these formulas right here so even though we do not know the interest rate we have this formula if we look at the price if we look at the series of price something like this we are able to find out the interest rate. So this is what we learned today, and hopefully you guys will be able to calculate this following this formula. It is pretty easy, just P0 to 2 divided by P0 to 1, and um, so on and so forth. And then we come up to how do we value this compound, which is highly complex, because taking account of something called the forward rate, when, when we're thinking of two future transactions, we have to determine the long today. And when we determine the long today, we have to agree on the terms of transaction in terms of the interest rate. So we have to agree on the interest rate today. And how many years is this interest rate going to be carried out? How many years is this interest rate going to stay over? When should you pay back? If you not pay back, what will happen? So you're making a lot of decisions in, the, in now, right now, when you're thinking about the future. Okay, so that is what we learned so far in this uh, 20 minutes. So I hope this 20 minutes or 30 minutes have been meaningful. Hope we actually covered a lot. Actually, in terms of you guys know the industry overview and you guys know about pure discount bound and you guys get a see of the complexity of discount bound when you try to price it and we try to actually make a decision on the interest rate for the long of discount bound. Now I want to show you an example that can be a little bit complex but it's highly interesting just to get you guys sparking some ideas, get you guys oh. Think about think about this. Um, know how people make decisions in, uh, in investment banking when they price a bond. And please read this question right here. So you are the chief financial officer of U.S. multinational. You expect to repatriate ten million dollars for foreign subsidiary. So what do I mean by here is um some uh, somebody is going to give you ten million dollars from your foreign subsidiary, which is a part of your business. It is a son of a business. You are the parent organization. So some of you are basically a part of your business, like Google and Alphabet, which will be used to pay dividends one year afterwards. Not knowing the interest rate in one year, you would like to lock into a lending rate one year from now for a period of one year. What should you do? You know the current interest rates are first year 5%, second year 7%. And I'm not asking you how to do it because there are a lot of methods. But just to get you guys sparking some ideas, here is a strategy that the answer of this question, that is one of the answer that may work, really depends whether you'll be the optimal solution. But that is how it's going to work. So going to borrow, nine, CFO can borrow nine, $9.5 million for one year at 5%. How do we know 5% is going to work? How do we know it? We know from the interest rate. That means when we're making future forecasts, we're not making something like lottery forecasting. Tomorrow is going to ring, just because I think so. Tomorrow, on who um uh, tomorrow, I uh my mom is going to earn a thousand dollars because I think so. That's like. That's random guessing. But finance is not guessing. We're thinking of strategies for the future based on how based on the availability of information. We we have this available information right here. 
in the near future in terms of interest rate 5 and 7 percent and we're able to actually determine because our goal is what should we do in terms of in, in terms of maximizing our return when we land when we lock into a lending rate we're going to use this available information right here so if I borrow 9.5 million dollars what I happen is I'm going to borrow 9.5 million dollars and I'm going to lend out what I just borrowed, which may seem complex, but it is a financial strategy. I'm going to lend out the 9.5K 9 that I just borrowed. And after one year, I have to pay back 10,000 because I borrowed 9,000 and I have to pay back 10,000 because, you know, the interest rate. And now I got repatriated this $10,000, $10 million from here. I, get, I got repatriated this thing. And in year two, because I landed out a two-year lending of fixed income of 9.5 to 4 million, I'm going to get this. So this is a strategy to actually maximize your net income, net return to 10, 10 million dollars in the end. How interesting is that? So guys, that is a strategy, you know, might not be so related to what we've been discussing, but Imagine you will be repatriated $10 million, which means you will get obtained for $10 million. You can still borrow money. You borrow this $9.5 million, and you're going to actually maximize your return in the end. So in the end, not only you got back the $10 million, but I think you get an extra $90 million. Sorry, you get an extra $900K, $904K. Now, an interesting question to for you to think is is it really seven percent? Not really. What do I mean by so is a point that I actually emphasized like ten minutes ago is five percent is the average between year one and year two. It doesn't mean year two the interest rate is seven percent. So the spa rate, which is interest rate between year one and two, is actually nine percent and to be precise. 9.04% because 5% have to add up to a certain percentage and when you divide by 2 you get 7% and is a middle school math job guys 9 plus 5 you go to 14 14 divided by 2 7% isn't it so actually what you're saying 10 so 9.5 9, 9 to 4 million dollars times times by if 1.05 5% interest rate you get 10 million 10 million times 1.09 you're going to get this approximate number of 10 million and 904k that's so interesting right so here's actually one more example that I hope you guys can look back at your own time because I'll put a slide below and that's it today we finish with this compound and we're not done with it it's highly difficult you guys have a lot of reading to do and in, in the future you guys will know about how do we price actually hit pure this compound in the future term and in the next lecture, we are moving on to valuation of coupon bonds, which are actually a discount bond, but pays more coupons, but pays more, pays more time than the one time, just like the examples that we discussed earlier on. So coupon bond, in the next lecture, the discussion will be still highly linked to our discount bond because coupon bond basically is discount bond, but just pays coupons, right? We're going to see, which is a more complex way of calculating that can't even be done manually, we will be doing something like a T-degree polynomial when we want to price a coupon bond. And I'll, I think, and then we're going to be discussing about the yield curves. Yeah, so this is about our first lecture. So if I turn back to the homework again, um, your own time today, please read Billy Myers and Allen chapter 23 to 25, not only corresponding to the discount bond, but throughout this, our discussion on uh, fixing our securities, you can read it back over and over again. Um, take your time. And thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next lecture. Bye.